Winston and Felix here. And Winston just said to me, Felix, it's almost April. What stocks are we buying in April? And I thought, Winston, that's a genius idea. In fact, I've got eight stocks in mind. Well, four stocks and four other things that are not technically stocks that I think are... Uh, worth sniffing out. That, of course, is not financial advice, but it comes straight from the mind of a golden retriever. So do with it as you wish. Uh, but don't YOLO into stuff. Don't be an idiot, right? Winston is smarter than that. He wouldn't do that. You see the little nose? Okay, so download my full research report on all of this stuff. FelixFrenzel.org slash eight, numero eight, and stock numero uno. And I say that um, to be culturally inappropriate and also because it rather fits this company here. It is Mercado Libre. And Mercado Libre is a business that's a little Amazon-like. It is massive in South America. And just look at these numbers. And there's a real reason why the timing now is important. So let me walk you through that. With all of these stocks, I'm not just going to tell you what they are. I'm actually going to show you the research, the data, so that you can do this kind of research on your own and become a smarter, better investor. That's really what our mission is here. So look at this. Cash flow is glorious. And I need a blue pen. Growth health is extraordinary. The stock's gone up quite a bit. That's not wonderful, but it's insanely profitable and it's a C. Now, usually when you have a very profitable company, you get a very expensive stock. This stock, ABC, not too bad, right? It's sort of a pass, isn't it? And I'll explain why in just a moment because it's important. But if you didn't know what they did, well, it's an online commerce platform. Um, basically, you can list stuff, you can sell it. They've got a fintech platform called Mercado, Mercado Pago as in, you know, pay. And the fintech platform and, and fintech technology and, and, and credit and logistics and, you know, the whole shebang that comes with running an online business nowadays. Been around since 1999, founded in Uruguay. And um, it's pretty profitable. I mean, Amazon is going like, what? You can be that profitable? I thought you can't. They're doing it well. Revenue, 14 billion. A billion of that is is profit, and that's going up pretty nicely. 17.5% return on invested capital. That makes me go amazing. And profits are going up 23%. And I take these two numbers together as a real, like, thumb in the wind kind of a yardstick of how much I think the stock's going to up, go up by a year. And that's my opinion, not financial advice. Yeah, I used to be a banker. That doesn't make me right. It probably makes me wrong most of the time. But that's the way I look at it. Something that has a return on their investments, essentially, with their 17.5% and as profits going up 23% a year. Explain to me how in the long run that stock doesn't go up. Right? That's the way I look at it. It gets better. They've got 4.6 billion free cash flow. So they might not be the most profitable business out there, but their free cash flow is insane. It's like 30%. And that means they can do all the investments they want. They never need to borrow money. They're never going to dilute you. And they can invest and become greater and greater and greater, which is what they're doing. And they're doing this very, very well. They are beating analysts to a pulp with beating analysts' expectations every single freaking quarter. You'd think analysts learns, right? Would learn, but they are they're simple creatures. You know, there's people on Wall Street. Next time you see one, be kind to them. Endangered species and all of that. Analysts are going to get replaced by AI. Sorry, analysts. It's true. I was very lucky. I had a little bit of a stint in banking, but I somehow managed to jump past the analyst. That's usually the, the way in. I jumped straight into the trading floor as a hedge fund strategist, whatever that means, but it mean, meant I didn't have to go through like loads of crap like that. I, I very much respect the the art and all of that, but it's 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 tedious business. And is it is it is it cheap? Yeah, of course not. It's 47 times P. Of course it's not cheap. A business that great won't be cheap, but there is a but in here, as they say, in parts of Middle England. And it is, if you expect the company to grow at sort of 25% on average the next 10 years, which is what analysts expect, that 47x becomes 6.9x. So you go from 47 to 6.9. Why? Because the P is the price you pay today. The E are the earnings that will rise in the future. Uh, that's an accident yet to be determined. If you're wondering where I'm from, I'm originally German, just very confused. So if you've got patience, 
I think it's a brilliant business. And let me also tell you why now could be a brilliant business, a uh, brilliant time to possibly buy this. The peso, the Argentinian peso is, well, it's collapsing because the uh, chap now running the country is largely perceived as a complete nutter. I think he's actually pretty brilliant, but he is doing things that nobody's ever done before so that Argentina. I mean, Argentina has been a basket case in terms of economics for a long time. Uh, lots of uh, raping and pillaging of the uh, country's assets and resources by those in power and shifting them out of the country and all that kind of good stuff. And um, the peso is falling. What does that mean? It probably means they're making less profits right now because Argentina is a reasonably sized part of their business. And therefore, it could be quite a good opportunity. And if you look at a stock chart, really, the one thing you can throw at Mele uh, is uh, Mercado Libre is it's expensive. It's gone up a lot. But recently, we've had this little dip here. We're sort of consolidating down here. And that, I think, could be a nice entry point for someone who wants into this in the long run. Still not cheap. I mean, it was... In 2023, two trading at 900 and outside 1500, so it's still 600 dollars up, but it's it's not 1800, right? Where we where we were, so it's it's looking a little bit better, and and I think that's something that's nice. I I like to buy things on the cheap. Doesn't mean I need to time it perfectly, but I like to buy it cheaper than when it was really 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 expensive. It was really 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 expensive for quite quite a long time here. Now stock number two is Robinhood. And I struggle with Robinhood. And let me just put that disclaimer out there. Robinhood, in my view, is controlled by Citadel, who are the lovely, charming, biggest hedge fund in the world. People who really care about your well-being and your welfare and want to make sure every little investor out there gets the best deal possible. I always said that with a straight face. And they front run your trades, they get all your data, and they basically provide the machination behind Robinhood. And that's why I think the name Robinhood is so incredibly insincere. But let's not let our love for Citadel influence our analysis here. Cash flow is glorious. It's gone up a lot, which is terrible reasonably profitable, it's growing at a reasonable level, and it's not insanely expensive. And if you look at a chart of Sof uh, SoFi, a uh, hood, you know, I feel like you might be getting hoodwinked. Uh, you see what I'm doing there with the name? So there we go. It's gone up a tremendous amount, $19. People are now throwing $30 around. Some of that has to do with, with crypto. And some of that has to do just, it's actually a good platform. It's relatively easy to use. They are giving you access to lots of stuff and everything the Reddit crowd wants, the Reddit crowd gets. And look at the profit margin. It's 83%. I mean, that's like, oh my God, it's amazing. Under 2 billion revenue, typically that's a good sweet spot. I always think to start investing in a business, that's usually when they start to become profitable. They're almost there. Return on invested capital will be profitable. Earnings growth, so far, not nothing to speak of, but they're not really focused on that. They're just focused on growing. And because they've got powerful big backers, they will continue to grow. And eventually, I think they'll make some money. As I say here, revenue, 1.8 billion. Last year was only 1.3. That was the slump. So you can see there's some seasonality, bad stock markets, bad crypto environments will hurt. Hood, but this year they're pulling off a 1.1 billion free cash flow, which is pretty staggering on 1.8 billion revenue, right? So there's just clear, fresh money floating around bathtubs for a bankers to pass out and after they've had too much cocaine. And uh, stereotype, perhaps? Yes. Now, how are they doing in terms of management? Reasonably consistent. I mean, that's a small miss. We don't really care about that but reasonably consistent. And, and they could do a little better there, but I think it's more the, the way they're growing. That's really what they, they care about. Trading at 44 times PE right now, it's not expensive. But even with weird analysts who think that they're going to have more negative years ahead, two negative years ahead, apparently, this is just like what happens when you let algorithms run loose and then 190% growth years. So the people are just sort of saying it's going to be very cyclical, very up and down. But let's just assume it's going to do that sort of 38%, 30 something percent growth over the next uh, six years. You're still going to get to a 9x PE, which is pretty reasonable. So I quite like 
I quite like the business despite my uh, objections to to what they're doing there on the on the back end. Uh, I wanted to see actually. Oh yeah, we can have a look at this. So we are putting out this feature on OptionsWatch.io, which is what I'm using here. This is a platform we're building, and one thing we're doing is we're going to give you access to see Wall Street trades. So the Citadel trades, the the, the block trades, the dark pool trades, and actually show them to you from the last. 24 hours because that gives you an indication of how people are feeling. And if you look at that here, got one bearish, two bullish trades, not a lot of institutional activity on this right now. So it doesn't give you a huge reading. I'd say it gives you a moderately bullish reading, but not, not, not a great deal. But then, you know, on some of the stocks we look at, you're going to get a bit more impact and you're going to be able to see what the actual trades are and everything else. So this is going to be a free upgrade for everybody on the founders tier, which are the original people who joined this app. That tier is still open, by the way, and that gives you a one month free trial. So if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you tell me. And if you then stick around, you'll also get the benefit of the free upgrade to our smart money trades. If you join us after we launch the feature in about a week, you're going to have to pay for the smart money trades. And I think it's just a nice way of saying thank you to our early supporters here. And stock number three is SoFi. And SoFi has this profile. I love, I love these charts. App Economy Insights put these out. Great Twitter channel. X channel, apparently. I still always think X sounds like it's a porn channel, but apparently it's not. It's, it's all kosher because it's Elon. And they are not making a lot of money yet, right? But that's not really what you want to look at. You want to look at revenue growth being plus 35%. That's pretty extraordinary. And that, that's coming largely from financial services, 115% growth there. Tech platform, 13% growth. That's going to accelerate. I think lending, I think that could accelerate a little bit. But either way, the cost of technology and operations and all that good stuff, this is pretty stiff flat. This should not accelerate much. And therefore, the extra money brought in should significantly impact profits. A lot of shoulds in there, but you get the idea. And they're growing gloriously. Anthony Noto is a growth champion, and he's got a massive incentive to push this, this stock price up because his bonus kicks in at $25 and $35 and above share price. So he really has an incentive to do this. Uh, like no other share, uh, CEO is he incentivized. Cash flow, forget about that number, honestly. It's a bank. It's not really very relevant. And these metrics are not particularly accurate on that one. Yeah, it's only just become profitable. I actually quite like that. I like a company that's just become profitable. That's usually when institutions start to look at it. I mean, it could become a, 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 a good stock. Price momentum is terrible. And we love that because it means it's potentially a bargain, right? And what do they do? Well, lending, student loans, but they're also a tech platform. They've just launched also some sort of AI customer service bot, which seems pretty good, which they're selling to other banks. Oh, the irony. They're basically just pinching uh, money from the banks that they're, they're competing with. And it's insanely profitable. 81% gross profit margin is like, it's wonderful. Earnings growing at 43% is equally wonderful. And... They are on 2 billion revenue here. Look at that revenue growth, 2x in two years, despite their core business student loans being kneecapped by uh, Papa Biden, who uh, felt, you know, oh, I was going to say something really inappropriate there. I helped myself back. That was the first, wasn't it? Yeah, ignore this free cash flow number here. It doesn't tell you a great deal. But management is very, 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 very consistent. And the 0 0.01 cent you can always ignore because it's a number that's too small to really matter. So that one too. But yeah, very, very consistent in beating analyst expectations. How do they do that? I explained that actually about a week ago. They do that by assuming worst case scenario for the economy at all times. So Anthony Noto is a pessimist at heart. And that's why every single time they report earnings, they beat. Now, you might think analysts would catch on to that, but then you're making an assumption that analysts are either not completely inebriated or smart enough to think for themselves, and clearly they are not. Right now, it's trading at 71 times PE, so it's like feeling that's insane. You're only giving us expensive stocks. But if they grow at what the drunk, shall we call them drunk? Let's use the word drunk. It's less offensive. Analysts think that kind of growth rate, 20-ish percent, this is going to go to 3x in the next 10 years. No, eight years. So it's going to be free, basically, in eight years as a stock. And 
that's why I like it. Now, do you want to see, do we have any, I don't think we have any institutional traits on SoFi, do we? No, I don't think we do, which is kind of interesting, but no, no one's, no one's doing that. We'll, we'll look at the next one in a second. And we've got PayPal. Now, PayPal is a beast that has performed very, very poorly the last two years. And that's one reason I like it. I think the core business is fantastic. I think PayPal as a product and Venmo as a product are not fantastic, but yet they maintain the largest market share of online transactions. And all they're going to do is pull their head out of their ass and, and, and do a better job and lay off people. And they've done a lot of that already. It's just we haven't seen the margins improve yet. 17% Net profit margin is pretty abysmal. Gross profit margin at 40% is pretty horrible. So far, what was that? 80-something percent, right? So gross margins should improve drastically, but it is very profitable. And if you need to salvage a business, what do you need? You need money. So they've got profits. Stock price has fallen, which is good. Just the rest of it is a little bit, you know, not really going one way or the other. Oh, look at that gross profit margin, 40%. That's terrible. Revenue, 29 billion, 4 billion. That's all right. 12% return on capital is sort of just okay. I, I like 12% more. And profits have been growing at a dismal 7.5% growth rate. But I quite like it as an opportunity. And they do generate 4 or 5 billion free cash flow a year. What do they do with that cash flow? They buy shares, their own shares, which means your shares become more valuable. And so they're spending all of that money, and they promised us that, on basically share buybacks. So we should see a massive whopper buyback. I think they're going to buy back something like 16% of their shares this year. And I, you know, don't quote me on that exact number. It's just from the shooting from the hip here. Um, the last quarter was pretty decent, pretty decent sized beat. We want to see more of that. We need to see more of that, a lot more of that. And you get a couple of good quarters like that. I think the stock will fly. That's obviously just my opinion. I am biased. I'm in on this. But it's trading at a thir 13 times PE. So it's the cheapest thing that I can find right now. And I like it for that. So it'll go back to probably a 3x. So it'll become like a free stock, like SoFi might. But the front risk is possibly lower just because right now everybody everybody hates this thing. And if you go again into Options Watch, into the smart money trades, which if you sign up now, you're going to get as a feature in about a week's time, then I'm, I'm on, the, on the beta test here. Then you can see all the PayPal trades executed in the last day by institutions. And you can see that they're almost all bearish. Right? So I'm like the, the, the sole bull out here. And I also quite like that. <laughs> Why? Because I don't need momentum to like turn around instantly. And look at these, how bearish they are. So it's these guys all selling $65 calls. That could actually be the same institution. See, they're all the same, these four trades. And they split them up to hide them. So they, otherwise it would be a million dollar, million dollar plus trade. But you can click on any of these, open up. And you can see the trade isn't actually as bearish as you might expect because this trade makes money anywhere below $62. This is $62. Anywhere below that, they make money. They just don't want a massive rally. So if the stock blows through the roof up here, then, sorry, not 62, 82, I apologize, $82. Anywhere above 82, they lose money. Anywhere below 82, they actually make money. So it's actually not that bearish a trade, is it? It's sort of a reasonably bullish trade. You just don't think it's going to like fly off a handle. And I think they might be right on that because if you go back in time, you can see this line here at about $76, which is pen. the, what is that? August high from last year. And that's at $76, and that will be resistance. So I would expect us to hit the 76 and then pop sideways a little bit, which is why actually this trade at $82 down bearish is probably a, a fairly reasonable one. So as I said, get your hands on a free subscription to, uh, to op optionswatch.io. Try it out for a month. Now, the next four stocks are not actually stocks. 
be thinking, Phoenix, you lied to me. Well, not quite. It's not quite as, as, as dark as that. The first is what? The first is, and the way we do this is by typing XLV minus SPX in here. That's not some crypto thing. It is XLV, which is healthcare, right? XLV is the healthcare ETF. And this is how it's performed compared to the S&P. So it has massively, massively underperformed the S&P. And what am I, why am I talking about healthcare suddenly? Healthcare, Winston wants to leave the room, is a defensive play. And when defensive plays take off, you should be worried about the S&P. Your tech stocks are going to get hit. This is a kind of a counterbalance. And because it's been sold off so much, all of that sell-off, I mean, all of this sell-off, it's pretty inexpensive right now. So it's something that you might want to look at. And I've got another one for you, which is, and I put them all into the research file. So if you go to felixfranzalog slash eight, you get all of the research, the whole thing, just download it. There's another one, XLP, which is consumer staples. It's stuff that you have to buy, you can't really live without. So if you do XLP minus SPX, then you see how it's performed compared to, let me try that again, XLP minus SPX, XPX being the S&P 500. Then you see how that's performed. Then that's also a disaster, isn't it? It's come down tremendously. So again, it's basically looking pretty inexpensive compared to the market. I've got another one for you. XLU minus SPX. What's S XLU utilities? Even if the shit hits the fan and the economy collapses and, you know, the guy you didn't want in the White House gets in or whatever, then you're still going to pay your utility bill, right? You're not going to go and strike and go, oh, Mr. Gasport, I'm not going to pay for the gas anymore because I'm against it. No, because then your heating goes off and you won't want that. So similar story, it's collapsed a great deal compared to the S&P. And then number four, numero four, which maybe deserves another word or two, XLRE, real estate. RE stands for real estate. Same shit show. And why is that? Because look at that. Look how, look how much that's underperformed the market and for how long, right? Literally since 2016. And we're in a real estate crisis, if you hadn't noticed. Commercial real estate is a basket case. We will expect somewhere between 6 and 12% of all commercial real estate mortgages to fail. Buildings are being sold for scrap value right now. And the banks who are financing those buildings are going out of business. About 100 plus banks I would expect to fail. That's not doom and gloom. That's actually statistics from the US government. And the impact of that is this. Also, high interest rates will do the same trick. So if you add it to this chart, US interest rates, maybe we do Fed interest rates. Here we go. There we go. See how much it's gone up by? We're just causing this collapse here. It's gone up. So the real estate values go down because real estate is generally financed and finance costs go up. The value of the real estate goes down. So these are kind of like potentially low hanging fruit without having to scour around and find all the individual companies. You're just buying the largest beasts in the sector, which can be a reasonable thing to do with a small allocation, of course, and do your own research and don't take this as advice. But I wanted to throw out something here for you that's a little bit different than going, oh, here is a Bitcoin stock or something, which is super high risk right now, just because of where we are in the cycle, right? It's, it's a boom and bust cycle. Right now we're in boom, 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 boom. And at some point it's going to go bust. It may or may not happen anytime in the near future. Nobody ever knows. But what you can do is take advantage of places where the market's mispricing stuff. And I think this could be one of those environments. So if you enjoyed the video, do two things. One, download my full research report on all of this stuff. Felix Frenzelog slash eight, numero eight. And get your hands on the uh, options watch inside. If you want to see what institutions are doing, what trades they're, they're putting out, then... Go to optionswatch.io right now and sign up before the end of the week when we raise prices for everybody but
you because you'll be on the founders tier free trial and then you can decide to keep it in which case you'll save yourself some money i thank you for tuning in i thank you for watching if you enjoyed the video share it and hope to see you on the next one which you just said to me, Felix, what three stocks do you think are going to massively outperform the market? And I said, Winston, that's a brilliant idea.